Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 11. We showed you in our other studies, we showed you how the writer may have laid out the, all the list of different people in Hebrews 11. <clears throat> people like myself are always interested in how, when you have a whole bunch of names like that, did you have any, is there any, is there a reason how they divided them? I mean, do you just pick names and throw them out there? Is there some kind of rhyme or reason to that? And, and it looks to me, at least for me, that there was in the way he laid out the listings. And um, because I know, I thought I would think, I think when I read stuff like this, I think to myself, well, if I was going to write this, how would you, how would you do that? Uh, because the Old Testament is just a large number of people, aren't there? I mean, wow. I mean, and, and what I discovered is that he did, at least for me, he had rhyme and reason in the way he laid it out. And he laid it out, in my opinion, in four groups in the book of Hebrews 11. He laid that whole group out in four groups. Uh, and so I, I, I gave you what I think he did. In Hebrews 11, 4 through 7, he laid out the Andaluvian period, and then 8 through 22, the group we're with today, he, he uh, dealt with um, the patriarch people. He went from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Uh, well, he went Abraham, Sarah, uh, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And then in the larger group, uh, I call it the Jewish people age, uh, he goes all the way from the Exodus throughout the history. He just picks them, then, and then he kind of lumps them together with the with the prophets and things of that nature. Uh, so for me, and then he, of course, he he takes it to uh, in verse thirty nine and forty. He takes it to us or we, which are new new covenant believers, and he kind of shows you what he was. Now now you get a picture of what he was trying to do, at least in my opinion. And so here we are, we're in the second group, in that group called Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph in verses 8 through 22. But what also was of interest to me is that once you see the four groups, you go back, now you have something to look at. And when you look at the four groups, he does something really interesting to me. He lays out in each group a specific faith cycle doctrine for example uh, um, in the uh, and, and so we have looked at each of them I'm in the second grouping and what he did in the second group that's Abraham Sarah you know yeah, yeah, yeah. in that second group 8 through 22 when he comes to lay out a doctrinal principle he does it in verses 13 through 16 and when you read him, he gives you two doctrinal principles. He gives you one in verse 13, and then he gives you one in verses 14 through 16. Now, last time, last time we looked at verse 13, and the first one, uh, without, uh, without the, you know, how the promises work with faith. And this time, without receiving the promises, in verse 13. <laughs> excuse me it's that it's that season last night my sinus was just so bad I couldn't even hard, I couldn't even hardly read the text my eyes just kept watering and watering I couldn't I was plus I had a bad pair of glasses and uh, all of that contributed and now my it's still running I mean my sinuses are still nuts I, I know yours are too so we're in the same boat we're in the sinus boat <laughs> and we'll be there for a while won't we uh, in verse 13, he, he lays out, I'm down in verse 13. In verse 13, he says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Uh, 
And we studied that without receiving the promises. I mean, that's, we talked about that last week. And this time we're going to talk about he, this confession. Watch this now. And those are, I laid that out to you last time too. They're participles. Uh, and this last participle goes with 14, 15, and 16. Having confessed, having confessed, that's the word homologeo, like in 1 John 1, 9, we're going to do in a moment. Having confessed that they were strangers and exiles. The word stranger in the Greek means foreigners. And the word exile is where you get the English word idea, pilgrim. John Wayne made that famous, didn't he? Uh, Pilgrim. Well, I, in one movie he did, I guess. Uh, on the earth. And so I'm going to look at that today because verses 14, 15, and 16 all deal with the idea of strangers and the exiles on the earth. All the Old Testament people were stranger and exiles, were pilgrims on the earth. You say, well, well, Rod, I thought they had the promised land. Uh, God gave them, yeah, but they were still pilgrims on earth. And we are. So you got to say it louder for my ears are plugged up. Exile. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, I, I just hate that so bad for you. It makes me feel so much better, though. <laughs> that it's hard for me to feel for you. If she wants to know what an exile is, is a foreigner. That's just the word foreigner. Like uh, if you went to Germany, you would be a foreigner. If they come here, they're a foreigner. <laughs> it means somebody that doesn't have a homeland, a, a, a land of their own. But that's the word stranger in our text, and the word exile is the word for pilgrim. The word pilgrim, the word exile is the word pilgrim. It, it, it means they're away from their homeland. I'll explain it in your text a moment. I'm just reading it now. But verse 13 sets up verse 14, 15, 16, so let me read that. <laughs> uh, the confession that they were strangers, foreigners, and exiles, pilgrimers, people away from their homeland, traveling away from their homeland uh, in somebody else's homeland. And verse 14 says, For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. They're seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have opportunity to return, but they can't return. Verse 16, but as it is, they desire, watch this now, they desire a better country that is the heavenly one where all pilgrims on earth, no matter where, what our fatherland is, no matter what our country is, whether it's America, France, Germany, Spain, yada, yada, yada. If you're a believer of Christ, you're a pilgrim, no matter what your fatherland is, it is not your true fatherland, that's heaven. We're going where Jesus came from and returned. We're going, we're going to where Jesus came from to earth and where he went back to. And therefore, verse 16, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their father, their, their God, for, for he has prepared a city for them. Where's the city? Where's the city? It's in heaven. And we know what that city's called. In Revelation 22, 21, 22, it's called New Jerusalem. That's Revelation 21 to 22. So, what the writer did in verse 13, he gave his two doctrinal problems and explained the last one 
why we are why we are strangers and exiles on the earth and that's a planet and in our generation we've come to know that the earth is just a planet among many planets agreed but it's a special planet because it's ours <laughs> so one we live on and this planet if you're a believer in christ i don't care where you live on this planet if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I don't care where you are. I don't, I don't care what the writer's saying. I don't care what your, what your country is that you live in. I don't care what nation you live in, because we live in nations, don't we? On the earth, the earth is divided into nations. I don't care what nation you live in. If you live on, the, if that nation is on the earth, we're all, if you're a believer, you're a pilgrim. You're a pilgrim on the earth. This is not your true fatherland. You're just traveling through. And listen, I got saved in uh, 63, I guess. 61, I don't know. I get them confused. The farther you get away from your, <laughs> your date of birth, the farther you, you can remember all those. And that's true with my new birth. But the church knew this. What I'm teaching you today was a common teaching when I came into the Christian church in 61, I think. I got saved in 61. I had to think of when I got saved and all this kind of stuff, when I got married and all that kind of stuff. Church knew this. What I'm teaching you tonight, the church knew. This was a common doctrine being taught. There's hymns on it. We sing hymns on this. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll talk about your spiritual pilgrimage. Yeah. Well, here you sit tonight with the Bible in front of you, I hope, so that you can study it because it's the roadmap to your life on earth and after. This, this earth is just temporary in your, in, your, in your journey. You're a pilgrim. You became a pilgrim the moment you believed the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead. You became a pilgrim. But you know what's good about that? Because it says you're going, you're going to leave the earth one day and be with the Father, your Father God forever, and your Savior Lord. So... The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people on a spiritual journey. Walking through this earth, telling people the story of salvation through your life, through the gospel of Christ, headed to a better place, a better country. <laughs> better. Who makes that better? Jesus, not you. Jesus. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. It's a better place, too. If you want to know more about that, you're going to have to prepare your heart for the study of the word tonight if you want to learn more about this subject. You should because we're all going to die. And then what? Hmm? Then what? When your body goes back to the dirt and back to the worms? <laughs> then what? Is that it? Is that all there is? No. That's the beginning of your of your existence and where you were saved to go. You were saved to go to heaven. You were saved to go to heaven. And that's what the writer is talking about tonight in this passage. Saved to go to heaven. Sure. Yeah. Sure. We'll sure answer that tonight. We'll sure tell you why. If that's true, then why do Christians commit suicide? Huh? It's true. They commit suicide because they don't know it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your love and mercy and grace. We pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of our life. And he will do that. He will answer your questions. He will answer them. But you got to be spiritual. 
Because if, if you hear it in the flesh, the flesh won't receive it as a spiritual truth, just as common sense or something. So what is the evidence of whether or not we're in the spirit or in the flesh? The flesh can't learn the word of God. Sin, personal sin. It could be mental attitude type of sin. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sin. Sins that we know in our heart what sins are. The Bible has told us. Friends have told us the Bible says it, and we know it because we've investigated it or what. So how do we, how do we get out of being carnal and being spiritual? How do we get out of that? We confess our sin. We confess it to the Father. We confess it. And the work of Christ on the cross will forgive us and cleanse us and restore us to the ministry of the Holy Spirit that will teach us. And so, Father, we come with that tonight as we enter this study in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the questions asked before we completed our prayer, well, if we're just pilgrims here, why do people commit suicide? Well, I'm talking about Christians, of course, believers, I'm talking about believers. Yeah, believers do. In fact, listen, one of the reasons that in your seminary training, they tell you to be, be very careful when you preach on heaven. Why? They say because people, when they get into real difficult times, they opt out to go to heaven really, rather than to stay on earth and do their ministry and their work. Yeah, I, I know that. And I, I'd been in the ministry long enough to know that. I went into ministry. I got saved in 61 and went into ministry in 63. I've been in it a pretty good while. And people do do that. And people do do that. I don't recommend that. Will they go to heaven? Yes, they will. I say, yes, they will. If they believe that Christ, before they committed suicide, if they believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead, they, they, what is their problem? They fail to see the importance of staying on earth because of the message we carry. Everybody in heaven's already got that message down, or they wouldn't be in heaven, right? You can't go to heaven without, without the blood of Christ. He, he died on that cross for your sins. He was buried and raised to get the, from the dead to give you eternal life. We have a resurrection because we believe his re, in his resurrection. And uh, you know, I wouldn't. But then again, I've I've been in some really tough situations, and no, I recommend you stay the stay the course because Father controls life and death. Life and death. You know, Ephesians, I mean, Ecclesiastes, third chapter in there when he says there's a time for this and a time for that. He says there's time to be born and time to die. These are both in the hands of God. And, and I really believe that's a better option. But I've known people, for example, I had a very dear friend that died because he willed himself there. He didn't commit suicide, but he willed himself because he didn't want to live any longer. And the Father, in his marvelous grace, opt on him for that. I don't recommend that. Uh, life is more than a detail of life. And uh, it's not an easy subject to talk about, but why do people do it? I don't know. It's not a good option, though. Suicide's not a good option in any sense of the word. Well, anyhow, here we are tonight in our study. Uh, we're looking at this second idea, the pilgrims. Last time it, we looked at without receiving the promise tonight, we're looking at spiritual pilgrimage. So I want to talk about four things tonight to you. In Hebrews 11, it starts in verse 13, but it, the subject dominates in verses 14, 15, and 16. When we look at our second doctrinal principle out of Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16, it comes 
from the old covenant believers, that's Abraham, Sarah, and that whole group, and it would fit all of us, I think, uh, it goes to, the, the, to their confession. Uh, having confessed that they were foreigners and pilgrims on the earth. That's really important. Now, the word pilgrim in the English, I wrote it down there on your paper. It's kind of an interesting word because it actually it consists of, of three, three parts. It's para, that's a preposition, and epi, which is a preposition, plus demos, that's a long E, and that's the word people. Para, epi, people. Epidemos became a Greek word of its own, dealing with people, a specific people. And para is a preposition of besides or with or something of that nature. And this word epidemos, in a historical way, when you're dealing with history, it becomes the word sojourner. You ever, you ever, in the Bible, you'll run across the word sojourner. Yeah, it's a common word uh, with, with people who are traveling or, or being moved from one location to another one. Well, I'm just traveling, and I'm just traveling from one location to another <laughs> location. That is called a sojourner. <coughs> The person that's doing that, he's on a sojourner, moving from one location to another location, a sojourner in a strange place, which means away from one's own people. And so this is a key word, sojourner, and para is talking about a whole group. For example, let me give you an example of a pilgrim. When they left Egypt in the Exodus, and they're, they're leaving a homeland of 430 years, right? Enslaved 400 of those years. And they're headed back to the promised land. Back after 400 years. They're headed back to the promised land, Canaan. They're sojourning. And what they're doing, they're doing as a group which makes that para epidemos. And when you have two A's together, in the Greek, they drop the first one. And so you have the word par epidemos, demos. But that's how that is. And what they're talking about is they're talking about a collective group. For example, when Israel came to Egypt, I'm just changed the Exodus now. I'm just going to leave an E for Egypt. And they were in the land of Canaan. They were in the promised land of Canaan. When we're, we're studying right now, a chapter 46 in Genesis on Tuesday night, when they left and traveled to Egypt, they did it as a group. Remember that? 66 people as a group. Going from here to here was a sojourner and 66 of them were pilgrims. The Mayflower and the boat and all that. It's the idea behind it. And so that's that Greek word. That's that Greek word. And that's the way it's used here. All Old Testament, here, here is Old, Old Testament believers on the earth. It don't matter whether you're in America, what, what continent you're on, or what nation you're in. We're all sojourners headed to the promised land called heaven. Collectively, Old Covenant, collectively, right? New Testament, now collectively. The difference. Watch this now. When this Old Testament group collectively went, where'd they go? When they died, talking about dying, when they died, 
Where did they go? No, when the believers died, Old Testament believers, when they died, where did they go? They went to, they went to Sheol. They went to Sheol in the Hebrew, called Paradise, Paradise before Abraham, right? After Abraham, it was called Abraham's bosom, Luke 16, right? English, 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 they call that hell, but that's not a true, this is not where unbelievers went. They went to Sheol for sure. Unbelievers went to Sheol. Believers went to Sheol. Fallen angels went to Sheol. There's three parts to that place. But for believers, Old Testament believers, when they died, they went to paradise or before Abraham and after Abraham called Abraham, right? It's Luke 16. Come on. This is kind of, for, for us around here. This is just, this is a review stuff no? Wait. They're, that's where they went now wait a minute where were they promised to go heaven over there what are they waiting on down here they're, they're waiting on Christ to come back a second time. You know why they're waiting? Because they're waiting for the resurrection, right? Wow. They can't go out of there without the resurrection. And we know from 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, that there's an order to the resurrection. It's a dispensational order. And they all, they all come after Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. The order now, he's the first, the church is the second, that's called the rapture. You understand this? So, what are they when they die? What? What? They, they're, and they're, that's their that's their promise, right? So, what are they waiting for? They've all well, they've all died. Abraham, he's gone there. Isaac is gone. There. Everybody that's listed in that chapter eleven until you get to thirty nine and forty, they've all died, and they're in Sheol. What are they looking for? They're looking for Christ. They're looking for Christ to come to the earth and come visit them. He's going to die on a cross, three days in Sheol, and he's going to be raised from the dead. And that is the good news that they got. Because when they died, they looked for the coming of Christ. Because it is the coming of Christ that carries their resurrection, their resurrection. Their confidence in being raised from the dead is based on the coming of Jesus Christ. Second yes, and his resurrection. So where does he go when he dies? He goes to Sheol, and he has a conversation with everybody down there. There's a conversation with those. He has a conversation. There are three groups down in Sheol when he dies. My good, look, people on the Internet... My people should know better. The people on the internet, you go to doctrinal studies and, and you track this information down. I have covered this in detail. I'm not covering the detail tonight, but this is, needs to be covered in detail. Wasn't it just like a pep rally going down there? And yeah, them? for some and for others. It was gone. I mean, he's going he's to have a conversation with the, the, the demonic group. He's going to have a conversation. He says to the thief on the cross, hey, I'll see you. We'll, we'll be together again in, in a little bit. We'll be, be down in, in. All right. So, you see, everybody, everybody the, the whole point of Hebrews 11 is the coming of Christ. The whole point of the book of Hebrews was the coming of Christ. What were people looking for? The coming of Christ. Look, 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 look. They were looking for the first coming of Christ like we're looking for the second coming of Christ. Our, our everything is about the second coming of Christ, right? right? It don't distract us from our daily life, but that's the next big event. The next big event is the rapture and the second coming of Christ. That's the big event. And so they were looking for that. Uh, in the Luke, the first chapter and second chapter, the pivot out of John the Baptist ministry, the pivot was looking the pivot was looking for the coming of Christ. 
the consolation of Israel, Simeon says. Consolation of Israel. So, now, look at the difference. Watch this now. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. New Testament believers from Pentecost forward, all about the resurrection of Christ. For 40 days, Christ dies on the cross, goes to, the, goes to Sheol. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. The conversation is all about Jesus has been raised from the dead. In, in Acts 1.11, an angel, he ascends, and they see him leave the earth and go into, uh, in, into atmosphere. As far as you can see an airplane leave the ground, and then you get in the car and come home. Right? Am I the only guy who went to the airport that way? I'll see you when you get back. Now, everybody was looking for that. Here's, the, here's New Covenant believers. Pentecost on. It's all based on the resurrection. Christ dies on the cross. He's buried. He's raised from the dead. Everything's about that. Here's New Testament believers. What do we look for? When we die, what, what, what do we have absolute confidence in? Right? We're going to heaven. We are actually going to heaven. When you die, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 says, when you die, to be absent from your bodies, to be present with the Lord. We know he's in the third heaven. We know that for, for, for a lot of reasons, but for sure we know it from 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Paul said, I, when, I died, when, when, when I died, I had this experience. I went to the third heaven. There I was, right? And I was not permitted to speak anything else when I came back. Jesus told them in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again. And I will say beyond you myself. And yeah, yeah, he goes into a great discussion about that. Now, how come, how come we get to go to heaven and they got to go to Sheol? They got to go to Sheol to wait for the coming of Christ. We absolutely go with him, and when the rapture comes, all church age believers who are died now with heaven with him, he will bring with him into the atmosphere of the earth called the first heaven. And we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the atmosphere like they saw him go, the, the airplane leave. They're going to see the airplane come back. First Corinthians, the third chapter, uh, or the fourth chapter, first Corinthians, that's first Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, first Corinthians, the 15th chapter, all teach that. We, we believe in that. The, the, but when you die, prior to the second coming of Christ, rapture, when, when you believe that, when you die, you don't go down, you go up. I know, I've heard all the arguments about it depends on where on earth what's up is. But I can tell you one thing, I don't care where you are, up is still up. Listen, I have a hard time learning how to get around Birmingham, let alone to know how it works once I leave Earth. Do you realize that when you die, not, not Old Testament believers, when they died, they stayed in the Earth. When we die, we leave it. We leave planet Earth. We go to the third heaven. The first heaven the Bible talks about is atmosphere, plane leaves, where birds fly and airplanes fly. The second heaven is where, where outer space is. We haven't touched, we haven't touched outer space in outer space. Right? We know that now. As soon as we get to some place and look out, we go like, oh my goodness. And when we go out there and we look out. <laughs> And who understands light years when you're out there? Well, you know, you just traveled 6,000 years. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> the third heaven, they ain't never going to find it unless you're saved. 
if you're saved, listen to me, you go right through the first heaven, the second heaven, boom, there you are in the third heaven. We haven't got, we don't have a clue. We haven't got a clue on the second heaven, let alone the third one. Atmosphere, space, and the third heaven is beyond it. Now, I don't know what beyond it is, but I know it's beyond it. I don't know if you understand what, how, what a tremendous privilege it is to die and to step out of your body existence on earth and in a split second stand into the presence of God in the third heaven, all by grace. All of that was paid because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every bit of that was paid because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what we are on earth? Don't put down roots because we're all what? Pilgrims. We're in a sojourner. Don't put down any roots. You're sojourning. Just sojourning. It's all about being ambassadors for Christ on the earth, being good ambassadors for Christ on the earth, telling people, listen, your ticket's already been punched. It's already been paid for. It's already been paid for, but it hasn't been punched. How do you punch it? I, your ticket has already been paid for. How do you punch it? How do you, how do you get your name on it? Believe the gospel of Christ that he died for your sins, was buried and raised. That's all there is to it on your end of it. But on his end of it, he died, spent three days in Sheol, and was raised from the dead and ascended back to the Father. You mean that's all I have to do to be saved? Yeah, that's all you have to do to be saved, but there's a lot to it after you're saved. Why did God save you? And why does he tell you you're a pilgrim? You're a sojourner. Tell other people about where they can go when they die, but they can't do it without Christ. You don't get it because you go to church, your ticket don't get punched. You don't get it because you do good works, your ticket don't get punched. But your ticket gets punched the moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. And do you notice I didn't say you had to change your ways, you had to do this and you had to do that in order to get your ticket punched? You see, your ticket's already, already been paid for. Your ticket's already been paid for. You can board the plane. When the plane comes, you can board it. Whether you die and go or the plane comes back and you're, you're put into the plane with an experience I can't begin to understand. You go, you go into a death place without experiencing death. How's that possible? I don't have a clue. I know you'll have one, but I don't. But anyhow, we're pilgrims. We're pilgrims. We're sojourners on earth. Look at verse 14 on your paper under point one. It says, for those who say such things. Make it clear. See there, that's a compound, that's a compound Greek word too, and it means to be doctor have doctrinal clarity. When it says make it okay, for those who say such things like I'm talking about here, who say such things, make it clear. Boy, I hope so. Make it clear with doctrinal clarity that they are seeking a country of their own. Listen, you're a pilgrim on the earth. You are now a citizen of heaven. The book of, of Philippians, you're now a citizen of heaven. The moment you got saved, you became a citizen of heaven, which trumps any citizenship on earth. Well, you're not going to get in heaven because you go like, you walk up and you got a t-shirt that says USA. That's why you get in because you're an American. <laughs> You get in because you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised on the third, third day. That's what this whole planet Earth business is about. Chris, I, mean, I understand that. I mean, I do. Adam Rowe. Okay. How do you know if you're saved? What's the Bible say? Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. You got a pencil? Okay. 
Two things you got to have. If you don't have a Bible, I'll give you one before you leave, okay? Uh-huh. Okay. There's your pencil you can have. Keep in your purse. I want you to write down this verse. We come to church to study. So we'll study. I want you to write down one verse that you probably know, you probably learned as a child, John 3.16. John 3.16. Then we'll put down 224, five, chapter 524. We'll put down Romans 116. We'll put down 1 John 5. We'll go 13, 14, or something like that. We'll put down 13. 11 through 13, I think, is what I'm wanting. I'm going to put down 11 through 13 just in case. Now, uh, here's. I, I, I could give you bouquets of things. I just want you to, this is a good question. How do I know I'm saved? Right? John 3.16, right? You familiar with John 3.16? For, well, listen to this, what it says. For God so loved the world. That's the people on earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have, listen to this now, here's the key word, eternal life. Eternal life. Not just life, eternal life. Eternal life, if you have eternal life, when you die, you go to heaven. Because eternal is God. The only one that's eternal is God. It's the only one. You see, so what, what, what he's told that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever does what? Believes. What do you believe? Now watch this. You believe that God sent his son to die on a cross to be buried and to be raised from the dead the third day. I know that because of 1 Corinthians 15, 3, and 4. They call that the gospel. That's called the gospel. You don't have a gospel unless Jesus dies for your sins, is buried, and raised from the dead third day, according to Corinthians 15, 3, and 4. Now. I'd add Ephesians 2. Yeah, we'll get there. All right. Jesus dies for whose sin? Who, who sins he die for? Hmm? Is it set for? For the world. Every person in the world. He's buried in his race for the dead third day. That's called the gospel. If you believe it, you got to believe it. If you believe that, you are no longer perishing, according to John 3, 16, you're no longer perishing, dying without Christ. Now you have eternal life. Right? Now you have eternal life. Do you have a problem with that? Do you understand that? Okay. Got to believe it, though. Now, listen. Here is 524. Pam, you got 524? Here's 524. Now, did you write all these verses down I've given you? Because you got to study them. You got your little Bible, you study these. <coughs> not, to, not just today, but you go home, you study these. Okay. I tell you the truth. I, wait, you do what? I tell you the truth. Je this is Jesus. This, this is Jesus talking. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Crossed over from death, spiritual death to spiritual life. If you you've got to believe this to get from spiritual from spiritual death to spiritual life, so that you when you die you can go to heaven. Now I'm going to go one more in John, just in John, the book of John. I'm going to give you my favorite, twenty-eight, verse twenty-eight, John the tenth chapter, Pan, verse twenty-eight. Now I want you to listen to this one. 
Here's three passages from John that tell you this. I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. When you, what, what, when you believe the gospel, when you believe the gospel, he's going to give you, this is a promise from God, he's going to give you what? Eternal life. Now, I want you to say that. Say eternal life. You shall not say eternal life. Say eternal life. What's she say, Pam? What's the matter, baby? I can't. I don't want to be here no more. I don't want to be here no more. Okay. And, and, and why is that? Tell me why. Tell me why. I feel like having lost everything in my life. Everything. Okay. But don't give up, honey. You haven't lost God. No. Just say, Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say those three words? The Lord Jesus Christ. Just say those two words out loud. Okay. Enemy's got her tied that. Right. That's all right. Look, that's all right. Let's go back to John 28. John 10, 28. Is I will give them eternal life. I will give them eternal life. That's a gift. Mm -hmm. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. And they shall never perish. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of my hand. No one. Okay? I want Romans 116. Bam. Romans 1 16. Now I can't make you believe it, Yashan. I can't make you believe it. I can only tell you the truth. I will tell you the truth. Jesus said it. I will tell you the truth. But it's, if you want it, you got it. If you don't want it, you don't get it. It's, that's what believe means. If you want to believe it, you get it. If you want to hang on to what I never had, so I'll probably never have Jesus, I can't help you. If you're going to hold on to your old life, and say, well, you know, I did this and I did that. Now I don't have anything because everything was taken from me. Well, you just got a good experience of the world and the devil. You're like the prodigal son who went out to the world and lost it all. Listen, if you want back in, the door is open. Christ died for your sins. He was buried and raised from the dead. And you say, you believe it, you get it. You believe, you receive. So here's what Romans 1 16 says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Whoa. See there? Now listen, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And he's going to tell you why. Listen to what he, what he says, Lashane. Because it is the power of God for the salvation. See, hold a minute, Pam. Please. See, he says, salvation comes by the power of God, not the power of man. Because by the power of God, when you believe that he sent his son to die for you personally, to take away your sins so that you could have a relationship with a holy God, when you believe that, you receive this. It's a, it's a gift. It's, you don't earn it. You don't deserve it. Nobody in this room earned or deserved it. See, the gospel is the power of God to save you when you believe it. Right? The power to save you comes from God. It comes from a power outside of you, not a power inside of you. It comes from a power outside of you based on what you believe in you. When you believe that Jesus died for your sins with burying and raised from the dead, when you believe that, the power of God outside you, the power of God saves you inside when you believe it. How do I know I'm saved? Because the Bible says so. Romans 1.16 says that when you believe the gospel, the power of God to save you saves you. How do I know I'm saved? Because I believe the gospel, because the Bible says so. I believe it. Why do I? Not because I feel something. Not because any of that. It's because the Bible says so. Here is 1 John 5, 11-13, Pam. Let me see where 11 is. I, for some reason, that just clicks in my head. That 1 John 5, 11 through 13.
Verse 10, 5. And this is the testimony. Yeah, watch this. Now, this is the testimony. Watch this. God has given us eternal life. Yeah. Look, at God has given us eternal life. When do I get eternal life? The moment I believe the gospel of Christ, I receive eternal life. God takes something from us that, that is terrible, perishing, one of 13 judicial charges, and gives us something wonderful, the gift of eternal life. He takes the 13 away and gives you something that's better. He gives you eternal life. Eternal life is the life of God forever. You get it now, and you have it forever. Here we go. Uh, so That's the testimony. Yeah, this is the testimony. Life is in his son. Uh, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. What? He'll give you eternal life, but you see it comes from that. When you believe the gospel of Christ, he's going to give you eternal life. He's going to give you eternal life. That's a promise from God. How do I know that? The Bible says so. Because the Bible says so. Right there. Because the Bible says so. And it's, it, now the Bible is a pretty big book. Where in the Bible does it say it? I'm laying them, I'm giving them all, I'm giving you all the big stuff on the board about your subject you're interested in. Yeah. All right? So pick, pick me back up. Okay. You want me to go to 12? Yeah. Okay. He who has the Son of Watch this. has life. He who has the Son has eternal life. If you have Christ, you have him the moment you believe the gospel. You have Christ. If you have Christ, you have eternal life. They're inseparable. How do we get Christ? I must believe the gospel of Christ. When I believe the gospel of Christ, I, I, Christ is in me and I'm in him. That's an eternal bond. How do I know that? I know it because the Bible tells me so. Even little kids. We ask them, how do you know? The, the Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me so. Right? We sing that to these little kids. The Bible tells me so. How come we forget that as an adult? Maybe nobody in your life ever sang that to you. Maybe you came from a home like mine. We didn't see that, sing that. Boy, we sing it to all of ours. We sing it to them before they're born. We sing it to them after they're born. We sing it to them. I had a granddaughter in my office today. I sang it to her. And she's 20-something. <laughs> these little, these are good things to remember. And if it takes a song to jar your memory, it's good. Oh, let's see. Where, where we are now, Pam? Two, uh, where is that 12? If you have Christ, then yeah, yeah, yeah. Now what? Uh, he says, who, who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And number 13. If you don't have Christ, then you don't have eternal life. If you don't believe in Christ, then you don't have eternal life. Now what? Uh, it says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Right. So you may know that you have eternal life. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Let me ask you something. Can you say, Lord Jesus Christ, can you say those words? Not loud. Lord. Jesus Christ. Say Savior. Say Savior. Come into my life because I believe you died for me. You buried and rose again. I want you in my life. Tell him. You want him in your life, right? This heart of the feet. that yet. He's going to resist that. You 
You can overcome him by faith by saying, I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior, that he died and rose again, and I want his life in me now. I want him to live in me now. That's all you have to do. And I think you believe what, what we've been telling you, the death, burial, and resurrection. You believe that, right? And say, Father, thank you for saving me. You can say that. Father, thank you for saving me because I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior. Look, at this life on earth is reason it's called a pilgrimage. It's not easy. It's not easy. If you think that we're all set and here, our life is easy, it is not easy. But you have the, the power available to you Claim what God promises you. Will you accept? Will you simply invite Him into your life as your Savior? And guess what? You got it. And you know why? Because the Word of God is nothing but the words of God and through, through Jesus Christ. It's a man named Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit right now is working to open up your mind and your and, and your resistance. So that you can know that you have eternal life. That's what the rest of that verse in 1 John talks about. It's faith, not feelings. Yeah, and it's, it's faith, faith, not feelings. Not okay. Well, you're in the right church. And you were the right guy. We're glad you're here. And Gary will talk to you after the service a little bit. And, and, and he's home, and he's, he's more than willing to do that with you. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome, man. Thank you, Gary. I've been there. Haven't we all? Yeah. Haven't we all? Listen, let me, go, let me show you a second point about a pilgrimage, and then i got to wrap this up. You can read the rest of it, and if not, well, I'll bring it back. When we're talking about a pilgrimage... We've talked about this, uh, and um, oh, let's see. I think, Gary, I think, I got my name on it. Let me make sure I didn't mess it up. Nah, I did. Have you got one of these? No, no, I want a big one. See me right after class to give her one of these, okay. and she can work on it between now and coming back to class next time, and you, you coach her with that. Okay, and we'll we'll work on this. Amen. You guys connect after class. I think I got some down here. If not, I got some upstairs. Okay. Uh, that'll give her a little study guide to work on, and we can work with her with uh, uh, you and Ernie tag team on that. Okay. Um. This idea of a pilgrim going from here over to here. Let me show it to you. A guy who experienced it twice. Noah. No, now, Noah's in our group. Uh, in the, in the, not, not the second group, but in that first group is Noah. Uh, uh, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. Remember that group? Three. Uh, Noah. Now, I think Noah is really in a, a, a wonderful example of the idea of a pilgrim because he had to do it twice. Kind of like, I suppose, the, the Mayflower business. But Noah was a good example of the doctrinal principle of a spiritual pilgrimage. He was listed in the first group called the antediluvian period of Hebrews 11, 4 through 7. What is interesting to me and why he's in that list is that Noah experienced it twice on earth before dying. And sometimes we fail to see the importance of that. The first time was when he boarded the ark as a spiritual pilgrims and left the antediluvian world to travel to a new world. I mean, the entire earth is going to be flooded by water. And he's coming out of that on a boat as a, as a pilgrim. He was a pilgrim then. He gets on a boat and he's going to a new world, right? It's called the post-diluvian world. 
When he departed from the ark after the flood, it was to be a spiritual pilgrim for a second time on the earth, this time in the post-Diluvian world in which you and I live. That is an interesting story. So, here's my point to you. Next time you see a rainbow, let it remind you that you are a spiritual pilgrim on the earth. Genesis 9, 13 through 16 talks about the rainbow. <laughs> it should also remind you that earth is not your fatherland or country. And if time permitted me tonight, and it doesn't because I can't even complete what I have, I could show you this in the life of Abraham who did it and the life of Joseph who did it. But Noah did it twice before he died in two different worlds. That's pretty amazing to me. And so I hope it will be amazing to you as you look at the life of Noah. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, I've got point three and four, and I'll determine between now and next week whether I need to go back to it because what we experienced in our study tonight was of much more value, much more value than what we could have possibly talked about it, Gary. And I appreciate the leading of the Lord on that. Um, let's close in a word of prayer. We'll let our internet people go. We'll have a little short period of, of prayer. And then, Gary, uh, you, you guys connect a little bit. I want to give you some material that will help you in your studies on what we talked about tonight with Gary, with you, okay? All right, let's, let's have prayer. Father, we're thankful tonight for those things that our hearts have experienced tonight. You know, Father, it's, it's about becoming real. It's pretty obvious about becoming real. And you'll become real with us when we become real with you, that's for sure. And she needs some of that dose of, of God being real in her life. It's not about things. Oh, if I had a new house, if I had a new car, if I had a new job, if I had a new this, if I had a new that, if I had another this, if I had another that, it's never about that. It is about a personal relationship with you, Father, where you become our daddy. And we know that if we live by faith, like we saw in Hebrews eleven six, 6, if we live by faith, it pleases you. And without faith, it does not please you. We have to be children that are obedient to the truth of the word of God. We have to be children that believe in Romans 4.21, that what God has promised, he is willing and able to perform, to do what he promises. He will do it, but he don't, won't do it with doubt, distrust, mistrust. He does it through faith, faith. Where does faith come from? Faith comes from the word of God. Often our faith <clears throat> has little value to our life because the word of God has little value to our life. The most important thing I bought after I got saved was a Bible. It wasn't an automobile. It wasn't a new house. It wasn't a new set of clothes. It was a Bible, a Bible. I couldn't believe I spent that much money on a Bible. And it dawned on me as I was reading it, my soul was excited. It dawned on me the evidence within my own soul for the need of the word of God, the evidence that I had been truly converted to Christ. I had been saved. My hunger for the word of God. And then I read in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. I pray for that tonight. I pray for that tonight in the life of all of our lives. 
especially those who have doubt like Thomas. Show me. Show me. I will if you'll get real with me. I'll show you things that your heart could never imagine if you'll get real with me. Show me. Show me. I mean, show you more than my son died on a cross for your sins so you could go to heaven? Show you more? I will. When that becomes first place in your life, I'll show you so many things that your heart will not stand at all. It will go beyond. It will surpass all comprehension. Boy, that's true in my life. We're pilgrims. Thank you, Jesus. We're pilgrims, and we're happy to be pilgrims. In Jesus' name, amen.